Good afternoon. My name is Eli. Can you please tell me your name? Uh, my name is Nancy Morugi Wangoi. And what shall I call you? You can call me Nancy. Okay, Nancy, in this first part, I'd like to ask you some questions about yourself. Uh, let's talk about what you do. Do you work or are you a student? Um, I work as a registered nurse in a hospital here in London, and I'm also a student uh, in ICU critical care course in the University of West London. Hmm. Um, have you been doing your job for a long time? Yes, I've actually been a nurse for about eight years now, but I moved to London to do my current job, and I've been doing it for two years. Mm -hmm. um, what would make your work easier? I think what would make my work easier is probably uh, reducing the nurse patient ratio. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you get about five patients, but it would be so good if I got one or two patients, so I would be able to take care of them better and of course increasing the salary because it's not the best <laughs> and let's move on let's talk about um the city and the countryside do you prefer the city or the countryside i prefer living in the city because there's so much to do and you'll never get bored there's always activities although sometimes i prefer going to the countryside just to relax and just to get away from the city for a few days mm -hmm. Uh, why do you think some people choose to live in the countryside? I think they probably don't like uh, the fast life of the city mm. because sometimes the city can be stressful, everyone is busy and everything is moving at a very fast pace. It also tends to be more expensive than the countryside. So I think they move away just to have a nice quiet time, you know, where you're not paying a lot of money for expenses. So, mm. yeah. Um, what do you think can be difficult about living in the countryside? I think you don't have access to a lot of the facilities that we have in the city. So, for example, there are things like big shopping malls or just big things like movies or, you know, just a lot of things in the city uh, mm -hmm. keep growing. But then in the countryside, I don't think they have that much uh, access to things like that. Mm. They may have them, but in more smaller capacities. Mm. Do you think you would ever choose to live in the countryside? I don't think so. I'm okay with visiting, but I don't think I could live there for a long time. Like I said, I think I would get bored very fast and I would just run back to the city. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's talk about pet animals. Do you have any pets? Unfortunately, I don't. And the only reason is because in my current apartment, I'm not allowed to have any animals. And it's quite small, so I don't think it would be fair for the animals. Like, I love cats and I would I would want them to have more space to play around. Mm. So, yeah, I don't have any at the moment. What kind of animals do you think make good pets? I think cats are the best because... If if I was to have a dog, then I would have to walk it a couple of times a day. But then with cats, you just need to provide them with, you know, things to play, like toys to play with, and then give them food and give them space and their attention whenever they feel like. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the best kind of animals to have around. Um, why do you think some people like to keep um, kind of dangerous animals like snakes? I think it's just because of maybe their interest. And uh, some people just have that uh, feeling like they want to be in danger all the time, like to, <laughs> the adrenaline junkies, I would call them. So if you, if you have an animal that is dangerous, then all the time you're feeling like you're you know, stronger and you're overcoming the danger that, that comes with them. Yeah. Um, in general, how do you think um, owning and spending time with a pet can make us feel? Um, I think it would actually make us feel much better in terms of reducing stress and just having um, an animal there to keep you company and make you happy. And it's always recommended, you know, for people who are sick or just anybody really mm -hmm. to have an animal with them because it just makes you feel better about yourself. And you, you don't feel like you're alone. You always have something there that can, you know, play. you can play with them and not feel bored at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Nancy, we're going to move on to part two. And in part two, I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. 
And before you start, you'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say. And you can make some notes if you wish. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, here's your topic. Can you see that? Yes, yes, I can see that. Okay, do I need to? So you'll have uh, one minute to prepare this topic. All right, remember you have one to two minutes for this, so don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? Okay, so the place I would like to visit right now is the Maldives. And I know Maldives is just a beautiful place, serene and just a wonderful place to get away from the city. And if I had a choice, if someone told me they're gonna pay the ticket for me now, I would just leave right now the moment, <laughs> especially, you know, in summer. And I would want to go there just to get away from the fast city life. I've been working and studying and it's been so, so busy for me. So if I had this chance to go to the Maldives, I would definitely go right now. Um, uh, the reason is, you know, like I said, I've been studying and working for a, you know, a really long time. So I would go there, just enjoy my time, have a holiday for once because I haven't had a holiday in, you know, over a year because of everything that's happening. And uh, going to the Maldives, I think it would just make me feel much better and relaxed. And obviously when I come back to work and to school, I think I would be able to do that much better maybe than I am doing right now because I would have relaxed and you know enjoyed my time at the beach have you know some tropical drinks dancing and enjoying the evenings and you know all the entertainment that comes with it I would also want to do the water activities uh, some of them I don't know but I would really enjoy the chance to go and learn how to do them because I think I'm at a you know an adventurous person so I would love to go there, enjoy my time and come back having learned some new skills as well um, on the side. Uh, also, I, I would, you know, I would be happy if I could take a friend with me because I feel like going on holidays alone is not the best thing. So if I would have one of my friends to come with me, I think that would be really great, you know, really great. And it would make the holiday even more enjoyable. And, you know, having someone with you, you have more fun together other than being on your own. So, Thank you. Um, do you think you ever will go to the Maldives? I think I will. It's on my list. So <laughs> I would definitely have to save up for that. But I think I will go. Thank you. OK, Nancy, we're going to move into part three. And in this part, I'm going to ask you some more general questions related to the same theme. Okay. So. Let's first of all talk a little bit about um, travel. Um, so you're living in um, London at the moment. Do you think yes. that a lot of people in London and in England more broadly like to travel? I think they do because all the people I come across and I meet a lot of people um, in school and at work. When we get to talking, everybody is always saying where they have been for holidays or where or where they are planning to go for holiday. Mm. And yeah, I think a lot of them do love to travel when they get a chance. And do you think um, do you think a lot of English people stay within the UK when they go on holiday, or um, do you think they travel abroad? I think they travel abroad because the ones that I've spoken to, I feel like I have traveled more within the UK than they have. And they've been here for probably the rest of, you know, most of their lives. Uh, they like to go outside the UK because they will tell you I've been in this and this place and they're always outside, you know, the UK. Yeah. And um, and you you were born in Kenya, right? Yes, I was born in Kenya. And it, would you say it's the same kind of um, approach to travel in Kenya? I don't think so. I think because of how we grew up and the economy wasn't always the best, mm -hmm. travel was something, you know, like a luxury, which everybody didn't afford. But I think now that things are getting better, everybody's changing their perspective and people are becoming more tourists or more tourists than they were before. So even if it's not going outside of Kenya, they would do like local tourism where they would go from uh, their their place or where they live to other places like enjoy the national park or the beaches so mm. yeah it's getting more common now which is good what kind of uh, preparations do you think people should make before they go on holiday i think you should do more research uh, regarding the budget you need to know where you're going and how much is going to cost you for 
you know, the amount of time that you're going to be there. And you should also be able to research the activities that you're going to do because you just don't want to show up to a place without any plan. Mm -hmm. So researching the budget and what you're going to do when you're there, that's really important. Um, would you give people any advice for um, traveling to, for example, London or to your part of Kenya? Yes. Um, first, those are two different, you know, two different places. So if you're coming to London, I would say the budget is really important. Save up before time and try to look for offers. There are places that, you know, give you some offers if you stay for a couple of days. Like if you are coming for three days and you say you're staying for five days, they may decide to give you a discount. So look out for things like that. And then uh, for Kenya, it's it's much better because you are not going to spend as much money as you're gonna spend, as you're going to spend in London. But in Kenya, I would advise to check where you're going because mm -hmm. uh, some places may not be very safe, but it would be advisable if you research in advance and get some really good places to stay when you get there. Mm. Um and let's move on. Let's talk a bit about um, actually moving to another country. So, for example, to study or to work. Um, what advice would you give to someone in terms of um, fitting in with a local culture when they move abroad? Um, I would say just be open minded. Mm. You are moving to a new country where the cultures are different and people have different ways of doing things. So just, you know, have the open mind that. They don't do things like you do. So just be open to saying yes and trying things their way. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you, you do everything that they say, but just be open to accept that some things are different and just try and talk to as many people as you can. And then slowly by slowly, you'll find yourself fitting in. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, and you mentioned talking to as many people as you can. Um, what kind of uh, conversations or what kind of topics are quite common when you when people meet each other for the first time? I think people will obviously, first of all, ask your name and where you're from and what you're doing at the moment. So you could say you're working or you're a student. And then from there, you can start talking about anything, really, your likes and dislikes, um, where you went last on holiday or where you're planning to go for holiday, just things like that. And then general things like the weather. I found out when you come to the UK and you speak about the weather, people are <laughs> very happy and everyone wants to talk to you. So that could be like you know one of the topics you could use to talk to people that's very true do you think um certain countries have uh, have certain topics that they feel more familiar talking about i think so because the part of kenya that i come from if you come there and start talking about food everyone will be very happy and they will be you know happy to talk to you about them i lived in sweden for a while and when i spoke to people about coffee and they were very happy because I think they love coffee and I talked to them about their winter. So different countries do have different topics that they prefer. Okay. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you for doing the speaking test. Thank you. So very, very, very nice. How did it feel doing the speaking test after so many years? I got so nervous when it started. I thought I was nervous before, but after that, I was more nervous. <laughs> right. Was it? Sometimes when you hear the Zoom um, call saying um, this test is starting now, or no, it says uh, this, yeah. this, vi uh, this conversation is being recorded. Being recorded and it was just like, oh my God, yes, it's here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did, um, you did exceptionally well. Um, in incredible. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> my guess is you've got a very, very high standard of your English. But um, you've scored band nine um, in the IELTS test before. And, yes, I, and I think this test as well would be band nine. I'm going to have to really? go through the video and really watch it yeah. <laughs> in detail. <laughs> but, oh, um, wow. There, there were a few mistakes, but th these mistakes yeah. were so marginal and had very little um, effect on the flow of conversation and on my ability to understand what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So like, just some... Just some small mistakes were things like you said slowly by slowly instead of maybe yeah. saying little by little. I think you might have picked up on that. I do. Some of them I could, you know, oh, why did I say that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's quite common. But it, it made perfect sense what you were trying to say. There was also maybe a, like a little bit of um, 
sorry the, what you can hear now is the rain in scotland um oh. let me know if it's too loud and i can always speak louder or repeat myself no it's okay actually okay all right good yeah. um so yeah and, and also maybe like a little bit of uh, repetition in part two at the very beginning where you yeah. kept on saying thing uh, you repeated things like if i go to the maldives i would be very happy um but apart from that it was a very very smooth um very impressive speaking test you've got an a, a, amazing very clear accent so you'd be yeah. getting band nine for pronunciation there weren't any words that stood out that you pronounced incorrectly um mm -hmm. you tend to really pronounce every single um syllable very clearly even oh. and um I was a bit worried that sometime that you, that as a result you might struggle with things like consonant clusters, which is words like breakfast. If it, yeah. in order to put the k and the f together, some oh, people say yeah. like breakfast. Yeah. But, um, that, and and I was kind of listening out because that's sometimes um, something that stops people from getting banned nine. But actually, oh, really? that 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 wasn't really yeah. So that might be something that you'd hear um, band eight students making a mistake in. But, um mm. it might stop you from getting band nine but that that wasn't something that you struggled with at all um mm. your pronunciation was incredibly clear your mm. vocabulary also very very clear and very impressive straight from the beginning it was it was obvious that you could talk about any topic that i brought up you know whether it was pet animals or living in different countries or um yeah. or your work um you had the vocabulary there and um and you were able to use precise vocabulary to really convey your meaning mm -hmm. so um things like access to facilities um mm -hmm. it, it, your your phrasing like if i were to have a pet like which is just really good using that kind of conditional sentence um you were talking about how a pet can be better in terms of reducing stress mm -hmm. um and then how how cities tend to be busy. So just like a lot of really nice chunks of language. And and what I'll do is when I um, edit this video, I'll put a lot of those chunks of language at the top, so okay. people can can learn. Yeah, I've seen some of your videos like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't even know those were phrases that would, that could actually add your marks. It's, yes. It's just, no. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes people have this kind of misconception that. <laughs> They have to use the very odd um, idiosyncratic proverbs and idioms, um, um, things like it's raining cats and dogs, and, <laughs> and they kind of prioritize using a lot of those language. But actually examiners are looking out for uh, the smaller phrases that just show a precise, subtle nuance and change in meaning. And um, you did that very well, I think, because you're so comfortable communicating in English. Yeah, I yeah. am. Oh, nice! Thank you. <laughs> In fact, I was I was hoping if I could ask you a little about about um about how you you got to such a high level of English and how it's possibly changed since living in London. Um, I think for me, growing up in Kenya, we had to learn English, you know, since you are young, from the first day of kindergarten. So they had to make sure that you're doing, you know, the pronunciation was good, and we were beaten if you didn't achieve the marks <laughs> that were required physically beaten um, yes physically beaten wow. that was a way of disciplining us when we were growing up and then when i got into high school they would introduce these books like uh, shakespeare's merchant of venice and then we had other literature books that we were reading and they would come in the exam um, so I think that's how I got to practice a lot of my English. I also did a bit of acting in theater when I was still back in, you know, back in Kenya. So we would do acting for set books. So these books that I'm talking about, the literature books, we would make plays out of them mm -hmm. and then go from high school to high school, just trying to get the, uh, the kids to understand the whole story. And then when it comes to the exam, they would be able to answer the questions the way they are supposed to. So I think that was also good practice for me. And I loved reading, you know, novels, you know, even watching movies that, you know, came in English. I think that helped as well. Great. And so, so you mentioned three quite, quite kind of separate ways of learning. There was the, the kind of harsh school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was the creativity with plays. And then there was the reading. And you, yeah, if you imagined your a pie chart of, of your English, 
Which one do you think contributed the most? Um, I think the school did, and also reading, because I used to read a lot since I was very young, from about, I don't know, eight years old, I would say. I loved reading storybooks from, you know, that age. And my mom was very good in buying me books every time I wanted them. So I think that did contribute a lot. And And all of those books being in English? Yes, all of them in English. Right. So even from the age of eight, you were reading novels in English. Yeah. Great. And um, and so you'd already got band nine in the IELTS test before you moved to London. Um, yes. Have you felt that your your language abilities have changed or your accent has changed or anything like that? Um, I don't think my accent has changed. I think I still have my Kenyan accent, to be honest. Yeah. Because I don't sound British at all <laughs> when I speak. Uh, but my vocabulary has increased, you know, has gotten better. And I think I have improved because at work, I can only speak in English because mm -hmm. that's the language that we use here. And then uh, working in a medical um, area, like in the ICU, there's a lot of terms that we use and that's, that becomes a part of you. So I think that has helped me improve as well. It it's probably great that you've actually got a job that very like relies very heavily on communication is yes. that right as an ICU unit nurse you're you're really having to communicate with a lot of your patients and and colleagues yeah. and you have to be precise in the things that you say I have to, yes yeah I keep, communication is very important so I really have to mm. yes and um and, and what about in your kind of daily life um because you're also studying um yeah. while you're in London have you found that um, you feel capable of writing essays, reading through textbooks, um, giving class presentations? Yeah, I do. And, you know, we recently did an exam where I had to study a lot about academic writing and the referencing system, which I never understood at all at the beginning because we don't have that back home but I I feel like I didn't have to struggle a lot all I had to do was read and understand what they were saying and I actually got very good marks from you know from reading and understanding so I think I don't have to struggle so I think I think that's good <laughs> great um yeah. and actually um some members of the Facebook group were very keen that I ask you a bit about um what it's like working in healthcare in the UK, because a lot of them are actually doing the IELTS test in order to get jobs um, in different parts of the United Kingdom and particularly in the NHS. Yeah. Um, so could you tell me a bit about your experience working in healthcare in the UK? Um, so when I moved here about four years ago, I started working in a nursing home when I came here. So that was private. It wasn't NHS at all. Uh, but it was really nice because it, gives, it gave me some kind of induction to the healthcare system in the UK, where I had to learn a lot about safeguarding and patients' rights because everything works different from my country. So it was it was very good. So I came to understand that, you know, a lot of things I have to be very careful about how I address the patients. There are rules I have to follow. I can't just administer medication back home, you know, like we did back home without prescriptions. So I think after that, I decided to get my job in ICU. So when I moved to NHS, it's also something totally different because uh, at the nursing home, I was just the only nurse at that shift, you know, during the shift. Mm -hmm. But here in ICU, I'm I'm working together with other nurses during the shift and the doctors are always there because my patients are like critically ill. But the, the NHS, I feel like the NHS gives a lot of support, not financial, but you know, the other support towards their staff where you always have someone with you and you feel if you feel like something is not right, you can always talk to your manager or somebody else um, who's going to help you with that. So, uh, and also I feel like there's a lot of chances for career progression. Right. Um, yeah, like I've been there for almost two years and I started my, my university like six, you know, four months ago and I'm not paying for it. So the hospital is taking care of all that. So I feel like if you're a person who knows what you want and you're ambitious, you can get ahead if you, you know, if you, if you want to. Within the NHS system. Yes, yes. And what about when you did the transition from the nursing home to the ICU unit? Was that easy enough to do? Um, it was 
a bit challenging because I, you know, when you come to work as a nurse in the UK, you come under visa sponsorship, which they call tier two sponsorship. So when I came, the nursing home was sponsoring my visa. And when I wanted to move to the NHS, I had to discontinue that visa and then get a new one for my new, you know, from my new employer. And that took me about, I don't know, four months. Yeah. And you have to be very careful about when you give your resignation because you don't want to resign from your old job before you have all the papers for your new job. So you have to be strategic about that. Like when you when you go for the interview, you submit all the paperwork and apply for the visa. And then when you get the visa, you have to give your notice to your current employer. And some of them want like a two month notice. So you have to figure out what to tell your new employer because you have the new visa already, but you can't go to work for them because you have two months to still work for this employer. Yeah, it's a logistical nightmare. And and I've heard it's a lot worse now, um, given the COVID situation. Yes, There's a lot more of a kind of backlog and a lot more um, uncertainty with how long paperwork takes to file and and get back to you and get all the appropriate signatures. Yeah, I mean, it can be challenging, but people are still doing it. So I feel it's still possible to do that. Yeah. And what about, um, because, you know, we actually touched on this in the in the test, but um, moving to a new country for your work is is a is a huge change, both kind of culturally and also in terms of kind of the experiences that you have. How was that for you? Um, I think when I moved to the UK, it wasn't as bad for me because I I think I did mention I lived in Sweden for a while Mm. so I moved to Sweden in 2015 and when I went there it was like total shock because I was coming from Kenya it was first time to leave my country and then I had to learn a new language on top of that Mm. but when I came to the UK I already spoke English my job was already there so all I needed to do was to report to work and in terms of culture I feel like you know Sweden and England you know both of them are in Europe, so the cultures tend to be similar. So it was actually very easy for me to adapt to living here. But I've spoken to a few of my friends who moved from Africa and from Asia, and then they came here. It took them a, a couple of months just to actually <laughs> get used to the life here. Yeah. But once you're there, and like you said, once you, you know, like I said, when you have an open mind, then things will get easier for you. Especially, I think, moving to a place like London that, you know, you, you like you probably got colleagues like you mentioned from from Africa, from Asia, from all over the place. And as, as well as a lot of people that have uh, been born in in England or, you know, even local to, to where you're working. And yeah. I, my guess is it's very nice to have a real kind of international crowd. Yeah, I really love that. And that's I think that's why I love London very much, because there's everyone from everywhere. And, you know, meeting people from different places is just it's just amazing. And to be a part of that is really nice. That's great to hear. Uh, Now, Nancy, um, for those of you who've watched this and really um, resonate with your story, uh, how can they find out more about you and, and follow your life in London? Um, So I have a YouTube channel where I talk about relocating to the UK as nurses or healthcare assistants. And then I share my life about working in the UK as a nurse. So my name, um, it's always Nisi Wangoi, uh, N-I-C-Y and then Wangoi. And that's how I am on Facebook or Instagram. So if anyone wants to ask me a question or just follow, you know, how it is to live in London as a nurse, then they can just go there. Ah, oh, that's very kind of you. I'm sure, I'm sure lots of people will. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for coming and doing the speaking test with me today. Thank you. Thank you then. <laughs>